Great. So hello, everyone, and welcome. This is, uh, as you may have just heard from Nathan, the last Zuby lecture of the semester. And it's really great that um, you're all here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and Meg, thank you very, very much um, from all of us at LARP for readjusting your schedule and for being so flexible and gracious and just willing to share your work in whatever format. So we really, really appreciate that. Um, I want to introduce um, Meg Vickery to you all. Um, she is a lecturer in the art history department at UMass. She taught a class last fall that I got a chance to go to um, called the History of Sustainable Architecture. It's open to LARP students. It was awesome just to sort of see that content being represented somewhere at UMass and, and we're really lucky to have her working within our department. Check out that class if you haven't already and if you're one of our students. More information about Meg, she um, earned her BA from Oberlin College in 1985 and her PhD from Stanford. Um, she's long been interested in the connection between sustainability and places, whether that is architecture and built constructs or landscapes or campuses or regions. Uh, in 2008, she began work on the exhibition Greening the Valley, Sustainable Architecture in the Pioneer Valley. So that gives you an idea of the sort of um, broad view that she has in some of her work. Um, and this project combined her interest in collegiate architecture and issues surrounding sustainability and brought home to the public the many and varied efforts of sustainability in the region. And since then, she has worked on numerous projects, exhibits, and books. The most current one is the topic of her lecture today. And um, the book just came out. It's called Landscape and Infrastructure, Reimagining the Pastoral Paradigm for the 21st Century. I'd like to um, encourage you all to check out that book from your local library. Request it from your library if, if it's not already um, being offered. Um, and I'll put in the chat a uh, link today, um, a link to where you could go um, if you want to get more information about it. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Meg for this talk today. All right. Great. Thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen and go to my PowerPoint and we'll get started. This is my first Zoom lecture, so um, bear with me. I should be okay, but um, there's a first time for everything. Okay. Okay. Here we are. All right. So I'll get started. Um, everybody can hear me. It's all working well. Okay. Um, so I want to introduce my book today and give you a bit of a background into how it developed, um, what my goals were, and what I sort of cover um, in the uh, text. Um, so it began here in 2012. Um, this is the old Amherst landfill. Um, it's, a, as you can see, a meadow right now. And in 2012, I was on a committee for the town of Amherst to help choose a solar farm provider for this area. This is, as I said, an old landfill, so you can't build anything on it. And the town manager or the town manager and the town, the town's um, director of public works thought, well, the old landfill is a perfect place for it. It has great solar orientation. What could be a problem? And I remember being both very excited by this prospect because this was going to be a big, uh, you know, a chance to power all the buildings owned by the town with solar panel and it showed great promise to me. But I also remember walking the site and thinking, whoo, <laughs> I wonder what the neighbors are going to say about this. Because the neighbors that surround this, in case you're not from Amherst, um, this is a wealthy neighborhood of very large houses, uh, especially in the context of Amherst Mass. Um, and they had pretty much adopted this meadow as their backyard and they walked their dogs and they went running and they went sledding in the winters and so forth. Anyway, my, my concerns were realized when it was announced that this was going to happen. The town announced these plans and the neighbors through were furious, very upset by the prospect of having a solar farm in their backyard. And at first I was devastated because I thought this was such an exciting project. Um, and I had also presented the idea that maybe we could have sheep grazing between the solar arrays so that we never had to use um, gas powered mowers. But this also was uh, the sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, 
so of course, on the one hand, this is a nimbyism that we, you know, are familiar with, and there was that part that uh, came into it. But more than that, it got me thinking about why people didn't want this, uh, what I saw as a sort of beacon of hope in the face of climate change, why this was, um, people's reactions were so fiercely against it. And so I started to think about art history, because I'm an art historian at, at the core, though I focus on architectural history. Um, and I started to think about old paintings and old landscapes. I'd spent a lot of time in England and everywhere you go in England, there are sheep. And so sheep in your view of nature and the landscape is, is an expected thing. Um, so again, I started to ponder this and started to do some research on um, the landscape tradition and how this tradition has been with us in the Western tradition. And I should add that this is very much a Western art tradition focused on Europe, England, and America. Um, because partly that's my specialty and also partly we sort of started the Industrial Revolution and we've sort of constructed um, much of the mess that we're in today. Um, but in any case, I started to think about the pastoral landscape and the pastoral landscape being this liminal space, this intermediate space where um, it's productive, it's got sheep, it's got orchards, it's got beehives, etc. in the long poetic tradition of Virgil, etc. Um, and as it was rendered in paintings like these by Claude Lorraine and Nicolas Poussin, um, they render it with figures, biblical figures or um, shepherds, etc. and the sheep, you see the goats here um, and the cattle in the distance. Um, and they're very contrived. These are not real landscapes. These are um, imagined landscapes. They're very formulaic, um, but they always include uh, the animal husbandry in, um, in them. And so there is a tradition of sort of accepting some of these productive um, pre-industrial systems in our landscapes. But what really haunted me were these paintings by um, people like Jacob Van Roysdale, um, these early um, 18, 17th century Dutch paintings that sort of broke the mold on landscape paintings. They were the first to render actual scenes of actual places. Um, and of course, the, they render the, uh, within these landscapes, these actual landscapes, were the windmills and the windmills powered society at the time they created they pumped the water um, so to make the land they um, ground the wheat um, etc um, and so they were a powerful part of um, Dutch society and they played a huge role in its economic development and similarly what I hadn't realized until I started the research was <laughs> these paintings of cows. And if you've gone you know, to a museum, you've wandered through the museum, you pass a painting of a cow, you think, why is there a painting of a cow? Um, but actually these cows, the um, eight, 17th century Dutch um, had phenomenal ca cattle, which produced beautiful milk, which was in high demand, both for its, um, for consumption and for the making of cheese, like Edam cheese, but it was also in high demand for making buttermilk, which was then used in bleaching fields, and it created an industry around the linen industry, which was in high demand across Europe. So these cows are painted, not because they're beautiful cows, although of course she's got luxurious um, um, golden coat and um, the sun is kissing her, um, stomach there, but because they were productive, important parts of society. And the other thing to remember about these paintings of the Dutch landscapes is that they were bought by the middle classes, by the upper middle classes. They were not commissioned, but artists like Roysdale would paint them and then he would sell them in his studio. And so people wanted to buy these, right? So what is it about that, those, those infrastructures that people appreciated and they were a source of pride, civic pride. They represented the wealth of the Dutch um, um, in the 17th century and so they had played a really important role um, in the, the features within these landscapes played a really important role in the financial and economic success of Holland at the time. So then I moved over to England. Um, so the D Dutch um, 
had some economic problems at the end of the 17th century. A lot of Dutch painters moved to England um, and start painting landscapes again in Britain um, and landscapes like this, which are sort of portraits of these great houses. Um, but included in these portraits are not just the, the elaborate um, uh, glory of the architectural massing of the house and the formal gardens, which you see here, but they include orchards and they include bleaching fields and off to the, the side, well, I have people here, but there are cows and sheep in the pastures. And these are included because they, of course, provide the wealth um, and prosperity of this family, this wealthy landed gentry. Um, and, and so they're included in the views and understood as vital to the success and prosperity of the family that owns this property. And then it's further into the um, 18th century, we see people like Gainsborough painting portraits of, fam of families or um, the landed gentry, such as Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. And they too are set within their fields, they're set within their landscapes that bring their prosperity, their wheat here, their sheep and cattle in the background, their copses of trees. Um, and there's a, um, a scholar named Williamson who wrote a, a really interesting article ab about the importance of um, both the timber, the deer, the sheep, um, the wheat, all being included in these views because they were part of the economic engine of the landed gentry in England. And so this, this appreciation for what was sustaining society, what was bringing the prosperity was included in the views of these landscape paintings. Um, it's not just pure nature that's appreciated. And we see this, some of you may have know, may know about Claude Lorraine's paintings, uh, or not paintings, his designs of landscapes. We see this in his landscapes as well. He was called Capability Brown because he could fix any landscape, so the saying goes. Um, but even included in these, so he would, he would clear out great swaths of landscape, he would create copses of trees, he'd create classical follies in the distance, as you can see there, or Palladian bridges, as you see there. But within these landscapes, of course, included are the deer and the sheep and the cows in the background. Um, there's also the development in the 18th century of the Ferme Arne, which is a sort of model farm. And this, again, was um, appreciated for its beauty and its productivity um, in the landscape. So I, in my book, I trace this. And then when we get to the Industrial Revolution, things start to shift. And of course, when you start to have not just a water mill, but an actual um, um, steam engine mill, you start to see uh, landscape painters like Sanvi here, um, including some of the industry in the background, almost as if it's sort of part of the fluffy clouds. And you see artists wrangling with this new these new developments, this new industry, um, in the way that they, you know, can we include it the way we include our sheep herds and our cattle herds? Um, can we include industry in the same way? And we see this also with um, Turner, um, where he's painting the city of Leeds um, and including many of those smoke smokestacks where you get a real sense of the, um, some of perhaps what we would see as more negative impacts of industry. Um, and indeed this painting by William Turner, uh, William, Joseph Mallard, William Turner, such a name, um, was commissioned for a publication about Yorkshire and Leeds, and it was never um, included in the um, publication, in part, it's believed by scholars, because it, it wasn't quite bucolic enough, and the publishers really didn't, didn't want to see so much industry in their um, landscapes. Um, so this, this turn of the century, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, artists are thinking about how does this new productive system, this new productive infrastructure, um, how can we include it in the landscape? Where does it go? Um, and my book talks about that. In America, um, we have an example, there's a wonderful example down in, Pencil, in Philadelphia of the Fairmount Waterworks. So this was a source of tremendous pride for the city. Um, it pumped, these were, there was a dam and these are the um, water wheels and they pumped the water up into a um, reservoir at the top of the hill. And this provided clean water for the citizens of 
Philadelphia. Um, and it was a huge attraction. People loved to come and visit. They could understand how their water was pumped and where it came from. Um, and it helped try and combat the problems with yellow fever that plagued the city. Um, interestingly, after this waterworks developed, and you can notice that it's it's clad in these ne sort of Neo-Palladian bridge with the classical temples above the water wheels. And what's interesting to me is that this park grows up behind it um, and wealthy people start to um, build near this. So it becomes a sort of attraction as a Palladian um, rural escape for the wealthy citizens of Philadelphia. So there's this really interesting, um, I think, um, inversion, again, an, in, an infrastructure that attracts people to it as opposed to repels people, which is how we usually think of most productive infrastructure projects. Um, so, and then I pursue, it. I have a chapter on other American painters and how they manage and think about, thought about, um, progress or industry and infrastructure. Durand has a very optimistic view of it. Um, we have the wilderness here, the wildness of untamed nature, and then we move around the water to a sort of pastoral landscape. And off in the distance, when we see, think of progress, kissed by the sun um, are, is the industry and the um, industrial infrastructure developing. Um, of course, somebody like Thomas Cole had much more mixed feelings about it and imagined that it would, um, that progress was um, perhaps more destructive and to be feared. But throughout the 19th century, poets, artists are trying to reckon with this and the, the change that um, the Industrial Revolution is bringing to the landscape um, and how do we include this in art? How does this fit into the landscape? So my book um, explores that in some detail. Um, and then I talk about um, a couple of contrasting feelings. John Martin's Great Day of His Wrath. This is a, a painting that was very, very popular. Um, it traveled across America, um, but it was inspired by for Martin. So it's very biblical, um, but the view was inspired for him by a train ride at, the, in, at night past places like Coldbrookdale in England, which was the heart of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and so he's wrangling with the sort of horror, the sublime fear of this new um, powerful industry that's um, lighting up the night sky with these flame-like reds and yellows and oranges. Um, and in contrast, someone like Bierstadt in America is painting these vast landscapes that are awesome sites. Um, and again, I can't highlight it, but there's a tiny little train shed um, behind where everybody, <laughs> where my little um, um, view of everyone is. Um, and, and they and it's very subtle and so it's suggesting Bierstadt is suggesting that progress and this powerful beautiful um, natural world can coexist with each other um, but of course I also explore those voices like um, George Frederick Marsh who are complaining and worrying that we are damaging the earth and we need to live in better harmony and that industrial industry um, and um, the burning of fossil fuels that were changing the climate. And I also look at William Morris and his um, ideas, um, which I don't have an illustration of here, but his ideas about, um, he envisioned a factory as it might be. And this is a factory which is uh, set in a beautiful landscape that benefits the landscape and benefits and educates the um, people working there. And there's this sort of reimagined harmony sort of looking back almost to what we saw with um, the uh, Roysdale paintings. Um, so when I talk about um, Central Park and the evolution of um, parks in America and their sort of roots in the English landscape garden, particularly with the sinuous pathways, the copses of trees, the organized views, this naturalistic landscape, um, and it, what I found really interesting was, of course, at Central Park, when it was first designed, there were sheep meadows, the sheep were grazing, there was great sort of connection in the, sh um, 
in the sheep fold, people could come and choose their favorite sheep and learn about the wool that the sheep were producing. Um, by the 1930s, the sheep had been shipped off to the um, north. And um, even by the 20s, they were something of a sort of novelty, you know, like a children's petting zoo. They weren't appreciated for their um, productive animal, animal husbandry in the same sort of way. Um, so I talk about Olmsted, and of course Olmsted has such a profound influence on the design of our national parks. Um, and so I explore that question of um, the contrast between, you know, in the national park, that evolution of this, this beautiful nature that's sort of God-given, um, unspoiled, unspoiled, which un, uh, uninhabited and equating it to sort of God's country um, to be uh, used and um, enjoyed uh, by the white American pioneers moving across the West. Um, and so Olmsted's designs for national parks, um, I look at the way that they capture certain views, that they present this wilderness, even though something like Yosemite had been managed for many, many centuries before um, the move West of um, uh, white pioneering Americans, citizens. So I talk about that. Um, and then we move into the 20th century and I try and um, lay out plans, everything from um, Ebenezer Howard's Garden City um, to discussing Le Corbusier's um, plans for something like his city red use, where he, for the lower class, working classes, he gives people allotment gardens. Um, but for the, um, uh, the wealthier that live in the big tower blocks, which you see here, they generally look out towards a landscape um, and the industry and the infrastructure is hidden away. Um, and nature in these cities, uh, in his cities, is something to be, you know, you come downstairs, you take a walk, you walk your dog, um, but it's a nature that's not um, the same sort of productive. It's um, the productivity of the society of the city is somewhere else. Um, the natural productivity. In contrast, um, Broadacre City, I talk about how the right weaves in light industry, orchards, um, sort of productive landscapes within this domestic um, residential area, sort of weaving the two together. And of course, it's interesting to think about it during the uh, developed during the depression when people were built, growing many of their own um, fruits and vegetables. And so Wright is incorporating into his plans for sort of um, uh, city, as much as it can be for Wright, um, productive orchards and small industry and weaving them together. So the second half of my book um, looks at recent projects that are trying to weave um, productive infrastructures with society. So rather than create a power plant or a waste to energy plant or a recycling um, center that is far away and ugly and downwind of everybody, um, artists and architects and landscape architects are trying to br bring these back together. And I begin this part of the book with a look at the work of Michael Singer and his studio. And Michael Singer, I think is a really interesting um, artist. He began as a sculptor. Um, sometimes he, he sort of grew out of the land art movement, for those of you who don't know, know his work. Um, but he got interested, especially in the late 80s, when he was um, invited to Grand Rapids, excuse me, to design some public art. And when we think about public art, often we think about public art as there's a plaza and there's a sculpture, in the center of the plaza and we walk around it and maybe we sit near it. Um, and he was looking for sites for this and he saw this wonderful stand of cottonwood trees. And he asked the person if uh, what was gonna happen to this, uh, this was a degraded landscape here. Um, and they were gonna, the Army Corps of Engineers was gonna come along and throw a bunch of rocks along it to, to shore it up and they were gonna cut down this strand of trees, which of course do um, the hard work of flood control often. And he said, well, I'd love to do a project, but could I, could I work with these trees? Could I rebuild the flood wall so it's a place that's beautiful, that's accessible for people 
um, and that revitalizes a site. Um, and they gave him permission and this is what he um, created. Um, and then he got a commission, won a commission to, with Linnea Glatt, another artist, to design um, or to work on the Phoenix Transfer Station, which again was a place where they were hired to create public art. Um, and they said, well, can we actually do more than that? Can we work with the engineers, recreate, redesign the building so that any odors float away from people, but also it becomes a place of community. It becomes a place where it's actually nice looking and it's a pleasant place to visit. And you can bring school children here and they can learn about their waste and learn about recycling. And this again, um, sort of inverted what the usual infrastructure blight is. Um, and Singer got very excited about this project and started to think about it more. And he's developed other ideas over the years of trying to reconcile infrastructure, productive infrastructural systems with um, the public and with, um, uh, with beauty, with the natural world, etc. And one of his most recent projects that he worked on, now he's not the um, engineer and obviously creating a West to Energy plant takes a lot of expertise and he is an artist and his studio um, don't claim, he and his studio don't claim to be engineers, but they work with engineers, they work with the developers um, and they bring to the table good questions about what else can it be? It's going to be a, waste to energy plant, it's going to burn cleanly. They, for this plant they imported technology from Denmark and it's, in, it's supposed to be very very clean burning. They recycle their water so they don't drain the aquifers in Florida. Um, but they worked with the um, company to design a really interactive um, visitor center. Um, they had the idea that of the smokestack as being an oval so that it takes up less visual sight. Um, it's actually right near a very wealthy community um, that's newly built with a big golf course and so forth. Um, and I think this quote from Singer and this, his studio is really um, important. And this is what uh, the rest of my book sort of talks about. The next generation of energy sources, water systems and waste facility systems must be conceived of with the assumption that infrastructure represents an asset in each and everyone's community. Cooperation among communities, government officials and development agencies can promote environmental justice, generate ecological renewal, inspire civic responsibility, and enhance quality of life without sacrificing economic viability. So I think this quote is important and it sort of sets the stage for the projects that follow um, in my book that are trying to um, recognize infrastructure as an asset, present it with the um, uh, as a benefit to the community, something the community is involved with, um, and something that benefits the community. And in this building itself, there's a, it's right next to a um, nature preserve, which again, you wouldn't expect the two to sit next, side by side. Um, and you can see the bioswales and the ponds in the front, um, but off to the side, so you can take a tour of this facility and you look in one window, look through one window and you see the huge claw that's grabbing the garbage and throwing it at, uh, and putting it into the furnace. And you turn the other side and there are the birds flying and the um, herons and the egrets and so forth. And so you have this, um, these two things sitting side by side, um, working together in an unusual and unexpected way. So as I said, the rest of my book um, tries to um, shine a light on some of these more recent projects, such as um, this is a peninsula um, in Den in Copenhagen, the Amager Peninsula, and and it's set as you can see with water on um, three sides, and then you it connects to the um, mainland. Um, there's a lot of sailing and water skiing, but it's always been or been for a very long time an industrial site. Um, and there are two power plants on this peninsula. The first is what you see here. This is the Bio 4. Um, this burns bio waste, uh, biomass like um, um, wood pulp and so, so forth. Um, and on the exterior, it's covered with these very, very tall eucalyptus logs. 
um, and they they create a forest on the facade that actually you as a visitor can walk up and you it's as if you're walking through the forest you can there are windows occasionally where you can look in and find out how um, the furnace is working how the um, energy is being produced so there's this sort of beautiful um, uh, connection that is made by these eucalyptus logs and then it's planned as a a temporary a, a stopgap measure. So the idea is that when Denmark has figured out an even cleaner method of producing energy, all those logs from the exterior will be taken off and put in for the final burn before the plant is um, closed or moves on to a different source of ant fuel. Um, over here, this is actually a waste to energy plant, um, very famous now um, by Bark Engels Group. Um, also on the peninsula just over to this side and um, it has this landscape up the up, up this uh, roof of the building um, here's the smokestack there's a um, this is the very top there's a ski slope down here these are running paths and so forth that are planted with the what the architects call seed the landscape architects call seed bombs so when they bloom and the flowers bloom the idea is that the seeds will come will float across the landscape um, restoring the habitat um, around these um, two power plants um, and then there's a huge climbing wall that they just finished up the side of the um, building itself which terrifies me just to look at it but never mind I don't have to climb it. And I did go to the top of this and it's very steep at the top. And then the, as you turn around, you, you come, the, the building folds back on itself. And as you come to the lower part, that's the sort of bunny slope. So that's where I'd be. Um, in any case, it's another way that this has upturned the paradigm of um, the productive power plants is that when the plans were announced to build these two power plants a, a huge apartment complex was built right at the start of the peninsula and the way that the architects designed it is to actually frame views of the Amager Bach power plant so this idea that you would build a new apartment complex framing views and sort of embracing this new recreational space that also happens to burn your waste um, is quite an, an unusual um, turn of events. Um, I also talk about Walter Hood's so studio. He's a landscape architect. Um, and he was responsible for this solar strand at the University of Buffalo. Um, and rather than, uh, you know, a huge solar array that's wrapped in within a chain link fence, he created breakout spaces, open air classrooms. There are paths that meander. It's laid out in, as a strand of DNA from the, what you see from above. Um, but there are these intricate spaces that you wander through. Um, it's a place where you can see bunnies grazing and butterflies landing on the wildflowers. Um, a couple of others, I'll just go through these relatively quickly. Um, this is by Miller Hull Archi uh, Architects, the Willamette Water Treatment Facility. Um, and so the, the water treatment, the water is treated back within these uh, concrete walls, um, but the water here, the river that runs past it, sort of mimics the um, water processes that are going on inside. There's a large public um, visiting room of, or information space. And then off to the side, on the other side of this river, are picnic benches and um, hiking spots. So it's this combination of community, recreation, education, and clean water that I think is important. Um, this one down here, this is uh, abuts, it's almost finished, I think. Um, it abuts the um, Van Cortland Park in New York City. And the waste, the, the water, it's not a wastewater treatment plant, it's just a water filtration plant, but the, the water is treated deep within uh, the ground. And above this water treatment plant is a driving range for golfers. Um, you can see the sort of greens, um, the, the goals, and then there's a net over here. Um, but the ar landscape architect, Ken Smith, has created, created beautiful berms and gabions that um, create moated spaces. But there are also breakout places and um, open air classrooms where school killed children can come and sit and watch the sort of, um, again, the 
water cleansing, filtering processes uh, that are going on deep within that are sort of mimicked up above. Um, so this is a huge, huge project, very expensive, um, but finally, I think, toward finishing, towards heading towards completion. Um, I also talk about Periav Commons, um, started by the Sweetwater Foundation. This is an um, urban farm in Chicago that has reclaimed a huge um, abandoned site, um, sort of brought the pastoral into the city in this way. And when I talk about the pastoral, it is, it is about growing, but it is also about a place of community. It's also about a place of the there's a lot of job opportunities. It's feeding over 200 members of the community. It's a source of pride. They have an, um, um, what's it called? Uh, the fish, uh, they've taken up an old school and they're uh, the hydroponic fish, uh, it's not aquaponics, that is it. there we are. Um, and so they're working hard to sort of create these productive infrastructures within the fabric of um, downtown Chicago. Um, and this is one of my favorites. This is the, on the cover of my book. Um, the story behind this is really interesting. So this is um, in Hamden, Connecticut, this water filtration facility. Um, Hamden is right next to New Haven, and it's a suburb where lots of wealthy um, and well-educated Yale professors uh, live. And the, the engineers' plans for this were to um, uh, build a new water filtration plant, and the neighbors started to fuss at this and complain a little bit. So the engineers said, oh, okay, don't, don't be upset. We'll just build it like a house. And so you, know, you can imagine a sort of um, Tudor revival house holding the water filtration plant. And instead the neighbors got together and they landed Stephen Hall architects and Michael Van Valkenburg landscape architects to design this incredible um, uh, spot with this inverted teardrop. This is the start of the uh, water filtration plant. Much of the sort of workings go on behind this um, uh, fence on which um, vines have been planted. The fence was a later addition that had to be added to the plan after 9-11. Um, but basically you can walk around this landscape and the Van Valkenburg um, landscape architects designed it so that different parts of the garden of the landscape mirror the filtration parts, uh, plant parts inside the plant itself. So you have a sort of educational piece. This is the bubbling um, area and you have sort of landscape um, bubbles that mimic the bubbling um, process going on within. You, it's created habitat, it's created a landscape, it's created paths for the neighbors to run and walk their dogs through. And it's a, it's a stunning spot um, that could have been quite Horrific. And this is a situation where, of course, these are wealthy neighbors and they can control this, but they work together with the municipality and they brought in architects and landscape architects and they created a thing of beauty rather than an ugly eyesore. Um, and I think that's the sort of lesson we can learn. Um, there are just a couple more. This is the Sologard water treatment plant. So this is a wastewater treatment plant outside of um, Copenhagen, designed by Henning Larson Architects. Um, and it, this is part of a much larger park, which is an energy park. So it looks like from the air, it looks like um, a park with little with water features and boardwalks and habitats and marshes and uh, wetlands and so forth and some hills that have been created by um, that have been made um, but as you meander through it you go past your recycling center you can learn about geothermal energy there's wind there are wind turbines and then there's this waste to energy uh, wastewater plant that you can walk through so this bifurcates it's it's two wings these two wings and over which grow grasses and sedums. So you, and the paths go up and over. Oops, sorry. So, so you can take your dog or you can go on your jog um, up over the plant and you can look down at what you see within, or you can walk through the plant by the, the middle of it. And there's this um, wetlands here um, and flowering trees. 
and you can look directly in and see the processes, see how your waste is be, wastewater is being treated. So this, of course, creates an accountability. It creates a connection, a connectivity that I think is really important and revolutionizes what um, an infrastructure project like this can be. Um, another uh, firm that's interested in this sort of thing is WorkAC out of New York City. They designed, um, they were invited to design uh, plans for a, a new suburb and you can see quite clearly they're weaving the pastoral with sheep and cattle, cows, the sheep in the meadow here, um, together with the woods and the forest, together with the water um, fountain into their city in a whimsical but beautiful way. Obviously this wasn't built, but it, it indicates the, wit, the sort of wit thinking of the integrative thinking that I think is important. And then they've designed several um, edible school house, schoolyards for inner city, uh, inner city New Yorker, New York children. Uh, where there are gardens and they're producing their own, they're growing their own food, but they're interactive spaces, places to cook, places to um, grow and start seedlings um, and bringing the natural into the city. So the, um, I want to just finish here um, with a comparison. Very similar, you know, here uh, in Amherst, we were going to have a solar farm. Um, we did not consult the neighbors. We did not talk it over with anyone. Um, here in Hamden, Connecticut, um, the neighbors were involved. The community were, was involved. Artists, architects, and landscape architects were involved. And so I just want to finish um, the talk today with a quote from my book, the very end of my book. And I write, the idea for this book came from a small town's turmoil over a proposed solar farm on an old landfill. Below the surface, old cars, kitchen appliances, and the detritus of life's past break down and rot. Above, surrounded by expensive homes, is a pastoral landscape of meadow and birds. It was this pastoral um, view that the homeowners sought to maintain. After a lawsuit, the town abandoned the plan. Such a reaction, albeit on a small scale, highlights the difficulties involved in reintroducing infrastructure systems into our landscapes, be they suburban or urban. One cannot help but wonder if the examples set by the architects, landscape architects and artists outlined above, such as Michael Singer, Henning Larson, et cetera, might have yielded different results in Amherst. If the neighbors had been consulted first and introduced to the concept if they had felt a stake in the process and helped create something out of which they could be of which they could be proud, might the outcome have been different? If the proposed chain link fence had been replaced by an undulating hedgerows offering more diverse bird habitat, might the neighbors have welcomed it? Infrastructural systems that powered society were once a celebrated and crucial part of our pastoral view, as captured on canvas and built into landscapes. The role of artists, architects, and designers is once more to integrate our productive systems into our daily lives, thereby making the producers accountable and the users involved with the processes of energy, water, and food production. The users involved with the processes of energy and water and food production. The pastoral paradigm can help us change our views and celebrate that which sustains us. So that's that for me. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I'm not quite sure how we work that, but um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, we, I think maybe we can try this time. Um, people can raise their hands and speak out their questions. We can, uh, does, we can pick out, we can, if you see raised hands. Should yeah. I stop the share so I can? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, you, you can stop it now, yeah, if you want. Or if people are more comfortable typing in their questions, they can chat it, type it into the chat box, and I can, I can send it. I can uh, help you moderate it. So, can people raise their hands? I think Mark had a question. Oh yes. Um, let me unmute Mark. Uh, yep. Go ahead. Go ahead, Professor Hammond. Okay, uh, uh, thanks Thanks for a great talk, uh, Meg. I, I just also want to mention for the benefit of uh, the people at this lecture that, uh, that Meg was one of the uh, sustainability curriculum fellows a couple of years ago, and um, we had just fantastic conversations with regard to the research that she was doing, and hopefully that was helpful to her. Absolutely.
well in terms of that. I think of you often. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just the affinities between what you're doing and, and what we do in LARP and this, this sustainability piece is really critical. So uh, I just basically want to make two quick comments. Um, and one, one is a question, one is a comment that uh, the contemporary examples that you're talking about are almost this inversion where um, Leo Marx talked about the machine in the garden during the period of early industrial development and the, the introduction of infrastructure into systems that were pastoral. And, and today we're really talking about the, the garden and the machine that we're, we're sort of introducing, reintroducing natural elements into a high right. developed industrial infrastructural environment. Um, so that inversion is, is kind of interesting that we don't yet have a cultural historian of that, but, but I guess you're the, you're, you're the one. <laughs> but the question I have is, um, in terms of the Amherst case as compared to the other cases, I wonder how much of it has to do with the proximity of where people live relative to the proposed development. So with that solar array in Amherst, those were the abutting properties and they live fairly close by, whereas with some of these other projects, are they close to where people live um, or are people more far away? In certain cases, like the, the one in Hamden, Connecticut, the houses are right around. They, they abutted as well. The, the, there is a street between a small road that, you know, a suburban street that runs between um, the energy, the water filtration plant and the houses. But you, as you walk through that landscape, you you see them all the time. So there there is a proximity. Um, but I think that, I mean, certainly, and I, I have, I have to admit, I have changed how I feel about the reaction of the neighbors in North, in Amherst Woods, because I think we handled it poorly. And, you know, the way that solar farms are built today, who would want that in their backyard? You know, it's not a pretty place. Um, so the nature of the, the infrastructure is slightly different um, as well, but I think that, and there haven't been, as far as I can tell, that many landscape architects like Walter Hood who are working to integrate these into the landscape. Um, but certainly the one in Hampton, the proximity is almost the same. Um, and you would, there are certain houses that look down onto um, Stephen Hall's um, uh, water filtration plant and houses that look right out onto the landscape. So there is some proximity, but a lot of these are, um, well, the one in Copenhagen, they designed those building, those apartment blocks to look at the power station. And I remember walking by and you see this huge archway was well, a, um, it's a sort of opening in the apartment block that frames the power station, which you know, <laughs> really upsets the uh, what you expect. You would think that they would have shielded you from the views of the power plant. But, and then I asked about them. I thought, well, they must be low income, you know, because in America we put it, it would be low income. And no, it was a desirable neighborhood. So Copenhagen, yeah, we have a lot to learn from the Danes. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, we got one question, two questioners. One, uh, Justin Taylor is the first one to raise his or her hand, so I'll unmute. Okay. And go ahead, Justin Taylor. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. Um, so I'm a sustainability science student, master's candidate, and I'm always trying to like think of like different designs on, on like an implementation of like using renewable energy systems like wind or solar panels and kind of adding like a natural spin to them because so, mm -hmm. they do have a negative connotation I guess nowadays with like them being ugly and an eyesore and constantly being like a NIMBY. Right. Um, so for the Amherst, I just kind of have a question or maybe comment. So for the Amherst um, um, like waste plant or like that, that field, would there be any kind of like possibility for like visual um, like visual manipulation or illusion to give perspective that it's still a um, like a, a meadow, but also has like panels in the kind of system in, in the field as well. So I I'm really sorry. Oh, oh that's my sorry. So 
my dad is has an iPad that's connected to my phone and it's his birthday and all his children are trying to call him. Sorry about that. Um, um, I fantasize about that a lot and I try and figure out what could have been done and what can be done in solar farms to um, soften the look of them, to make them more appealing. I and mean, you have is issues of, of security, I'm sure. Um, and I, not being a designer, am not quite sure what they could be. I do think you, chain link fences are probably the worst awful thing in the world. I think that some of the, what's interesting in some cases is trying to, um, the sort of permaculture, the growing things underneath the, and around the solar panels. So you have life and um, fecundity instead of just these barren, uh, dusty landscapes underneath the, um, solar panels. I, I think there are creative ways to do it, and I'm the historian. It's your job. <laughs> I don't mean to whip out, but um, you know, I think it's it's going to be tough. I would rather see them on the top of WalMarts and huge box stores than in our landscape. But I think if they have to be in the landscape, there needs to be ways. There need to be ways to. Um, to make them less of the blight that they'll just continue to be. It seems like it's just replacing the energy source, but not the ideas behind what infrastructure can be. And that's disappointing, I think. I don't know if that helped at all. Yeah, no, it was helpful. Thank you. Okay, sure. Anybody else? We got a question from Rachel uh, Loeffler. Thank you for your talk. I, I love the fact that it goes back to the 1600s to today and how we're going to see of productive landscapes. Um, one of the questions I had, and it's probably not your scope of duty, but I'm curious about kind of the cost parameters of these different different um, exploits and um, if you have if you have access to how much those projects cost or cost per square foot. I know that's one um, working across a, a, with a wide range of clients, uh, cost becomes a big issue. And it, it's not something right. to be a stumbling block. It's something that we have to educate our clients about and be able right. to start with the conversation of, oh, you want this type of landscape or you want this type of um, experience. That's around at least $30 a square foot. And people are like, oh. um, yeah. So helping municipalities or private donors understand how much these um, really well integrated and holistic infrastructure um, implementation might cost is really could be really helpful and then also related to that is that when comparing two different communities if we can look at um, their tax base difference so um, right now we're looking at at school projects in the state and funding and funding inequity that's based upon uh, taxes available for communities and it really has a big difference if somebody's oper if a community's operating budget is only a million dollars and another community's operating budget is in the billions range, what sort of leverage they have within the community to, to invest in this type of improvement without hurting a homeowner or someone who is, you know, paying taxes into the system. Right. right. Um, so I can speak to it on a couple of I can give you a couple of examples where I have um, learned something about the eco the uh, economics of it. The one in Hamden, Connecticut um, uh, by Michael Van Volkenberg, that one, um, the municipality was very worried that it was going to be more expensive. Uh, it turns out that what happened was they were able to make savings because of the way that the architects and landscape architects worked out the plan. They could save on I think it was pumping because they used gravity. So they, they omitted some cost um, and then could spend more on the architects and the landscape architect and the landscape design. So th that project turned out to be pretty much right within budget um, that, that the municipality had set aside. Um, Michael Singer likes to point out that you might have an upfront cost that is a little bit higher, but when you factor in lawyer fees, and the delay of trying to f fight these communities that don't want it. Um, uh, you know, if you make something that includes the communities, you immediately, you 
and everybody's on board with this and working together towards a common goal, you don't have the legal problems and you don't have the delays. Um, I think one of the big problems has for the Croton water treatment plant um, has been huge delays and cost overruns. I mean, it's a, it's a massive, massive project. Um, I think that the the actual landscaping of it has been the least of its problems and the least of its expense um, compared to the massive undertaking of burying this huge project underground. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, another one that springs to mind when you're talking about different socioeconomic spaces is um, uh, the Newtown Creek um, water wastewater treatment plant that I talk about. Um, and I didn't include an image of that, but it's um, it's a huge plant that processes a huge amount of New York City's wastewater. And until it was built, it was never, the, the original plant that was there was never meeting any of the standards it was supposed to have for clean water. And the neighbors had smells in their basement and it, it's a, a, it's placed in a less, um, much less wealthy neighborhood. Um, but the, the new plant has really turned things around. One, it's it's a almost like a tourist attraction now. It's got big silver eggs, digester eggs, so they're enclosed. It's not those open mm -hmm. pools. Um, and while I don't know what that costs, I do know that it's um, been a huge improvement for the neighborhood um, and really cleaned up their um, neighborhood and the smells and the odor and improved that. So again, cost is such a tricky thing because the mm -hmm. long-term costs are, are less when you think about the benefits it brings to, to the community. Um, and I don't know, Denmark just seems to be happy to spend money on these things. When I was over there, I, they were showing this architect, two architects from Gottlieb Palenden were showing me this. Um, it's a cooling station for the, the, um, energy for for electric um cooling station and it's right outside the live the airport and we would drive by it and it would be an ugly box that sort of set within a chain link fence and they designed this beautiful sort of fin like encasement around it that provides cool air and then he said well and we wanted to light it up the edges up with led lights but we were worried people were going to be upset with us for that um for being extravagant so we we put a solar array on the top that nobody can see, but it lights the LEDs so no one is upset. <laughs> just like on so many levels that just struck me as absolutely wonderful, but, um, but not the sort of thing that is common over here yet. So I don't know if I exactly answered your question, but I, I do know that we, the town of Amherst, for instance, spent a lot of money on legal fees and we have no solar farm. Mm. If we'd spend a little money differently, things might have been different. So. Thank you. Sure. Um, and we got a couple more questions and it's almost five. Uh, Meg, how are you doing? I, are you fine. okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah so um, Christopher was the first one to uh, raise his hand. Um, okay. So Chris, you can, un uh, you can unmute yourself. Hi, Margaret. Um, I was I was wondering if you came across any case studies that maybe are slightly less cutting edge from a design and art perspective, but might have more directly measured and, and easier to argue co-benefits. And I'm thinking specifically on the integration of uh, farming systems with solar arrays, especially uh, pasturing systems. I've read a bit on rotational grazing and how to design the density of solar panels and the heights so that it's amenable to uh, rotationally grazing different pastured animals like sheep and right. cattle. So you have, you're, you're getting, because especially up here, lots of times the solar farms end up replacing prime cropland, which isn't exactly a net benefit, um, most would argue. So I was wondering if you came across any work like that. Um, I haven't, I don't talk about it in the book. I have read about examples of that, which I think are f fabulous. I would still like to see something um, done about the sort of exterior, sort of making it not only friendly to the animals, but more people friendly as well. 
Um, I think that the question of animal husbandry is really interesting too. Uh, when I first started this project, um, I knew some people who lived near a farm and the farm got cattle and it's, it's a small farm up, at the, up in North Amherst and they got cattle and they, were, they got the rights to graze on um, what people considered to be their, um, their great view west toward, um, uh, toward the Berkshires. And people, they actually sold their house and moved away because they didn't want to see the cows and smell the cows. And so that kind of disconnect, you know, I think again, it's a, it's a sort of, it's a win-win. It, it enhances the views and it's part of, um, and, and it's part of a hopeful future, but not everybody sees it that way. And like I said, when I recommended the sheep between the solar farm, <laughs> that was not well received. Um, so I haven't focused on that, but I think that um, those are really important synergies that we should always be looking for where, um, what else can we do? And I think that can be the, like Michael Singer often talks about, it's the questions he asks, you know? It, it's asking the right questions, not just going along with how things have always been done. Um, and fresh voices and different people at the table can, can ask really helpful questions. So. And uh, we have uh, one more question from Brianna. So you can unmute yourself, Brianna. Hi, Margaret. I'm actually one of your um, students in art history. Uh, I loved your lectures, so I thought this would be really interesting and it brought to light a lot of cool new information about architecture um, that I wasn't aware of. So thank you for that. Great. Uh, I just have a quick sort of like speculation question. Um, Obviously, there are already a lot of solar farms and water treatment plants uh, that already exist. Uh, do you think it's possible that, you know, we could redesign them, that people would be more acceptable towards that, if that's even possible, to add more of a sustainable look to them? Um, I hope so. I know that... Um... For instance, Mount Tom is close by and it used to be a coal fired, fired power plant. And when they retired that, um, they've now made it a solar farm. Um, but I, I, had a, I had sort of hoped for and had talked to some people about making it a little bit more than a solar, simply a solar farm, um, maybe anaerobic digestion and um, um, Mount, it's right near Mount Tom, which has a lot of invasive species, and I'd like to see goats there. You know, how can you work all these elements out so that you're benefiting n not just the community by producing electricity, but you're benefiting the natural ecosystems, you're benefiting the people in the community that live near them. So um, I think there's great potential to renovate these places. Um, especially as they transition away from something like coal or oil um, and gas, things that you can't um, perhaps climb onto or you don't want to be breathing down, you know, downwind of those. Um, but as our energy sources change, we need to be thinking about how do we um, take that old infrastructure and bring it back to the community in various ways. So I think that's a great question and I think we should keep our eyes open for the potential. And again, including the, the creative minds who think of these things, you know, I think it's um, just, if I have one goal, it would be that it became sort of standard to invite landscape architects and architects and artists to the table when you're planning these projects because Without them, you get the status quo or you get the, you know, half timbered vinyl house over the um, water treatment plant. And I think we can, we can definitely do better. So does that help? Does that yes, thank this? you. Okay, sure. Anybody else? Nope. I don't see any other little hands. <laughs> Sorry, I don't see the blue hands. So nope. okay, I think yeah. we're great. Well, yeah. it was lovely to see some of you. It's always nice to see people. <laughs> oh, look, you can clap. <laughs>
<laughs> How fun. Oh, great. Well, stay safe, everybody. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you very much, Meg. It was a treat. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, look at that. Oh. You had a couple of young viewers. Oh, I'm thrilled. <laughs> Amanda Rookie said her son was also watching with her. Oh, great. All right. Well, take good care, everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.